Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Course of World History. I'm Mr. Samuelson, and today we are looking at the French Revolution. Our essential question for today is how did the French monarchy become the French Republic? It's a long story, so bear with me. First, we need to understand an aspect of French culture and French society that existed in the late Middle Ages, and that was the division of French society into the three estates. Now, the first estate was the clergy. It's people related to the Catholic Church in uh, France. The second estate is the nobility with the king and queen, princes, all the way down through knights and etc. Now, the first and second estates um, had about 500,000 people in it total, whereas the third estate included everyone else. It was the big group, and it had about you know, 26 and a half million people um, at the time of the French Revolution. The third estate was also very diverse in terms of education and wealth. Now, amongst that third estate was a rising bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie were the middle class in France, and uh, they were part of that third estate, but their share of national wealth was dramatically increasing during this time. Um, merchants and bankers and industrialists, lawyers, doctors are accumulating wealth and becoming um, you know, more, more well off in many cases, even better off than some people within the nobility. But they were denied that higher status, that higher social status, because they did not have that noble birth. And over time, they grew to resent that. Now, at the time of the 1700s, late 1700s, France goes into a bit of a financial crisis. The economy had been growing throughout the 1700s, but it had grown really unevenly and unsteadily. And not everybody was prospering from this unsteady growth. Now, the economy itself kind of finally tipped into real crisis mode after the French saw an opportunity to knock the British down a peg by supporting the Americans in the American Revolution. They wind up helping the Americans and they wind up winning that war, but they don't gain a large financial benefit from it. And that cost tips the economy over the edge. France is now out of money. And in order to raise any money, they need to increase taxes. Now, by French law, this requires a meeting of a group called the Estates General. Um, they hadn't called an Estates General in over 100 years because they hadn't needed to. And this had helped lead their you know, absolutist system, the fact that the king could do whatever they wanted. They were wealthy enough to do that. But now they need an Estates General to push even further. So in 1789, representatives of the three estates, right, the clergy, the nobility, and everyone else, needs to resolve this issue, but they disagree on how they're going to vote on issues. In the past, each estate had had one vote, which meant the clergy and nobility usually voted together and overruled anything that the third estate wanted to do. The third estate, though, didn't want that system, and when it looked like they were going to adopt that system again, the third estate simply said, you know what, we don't need you we're gonna form our own assembly. And they created something called the National Assembly. Uh, they did this by walking out of the, third est the Estates General, occupying this as an indoor tennis court and taking a tennis court oath that they would support each other in the creation of a new constitution and to create a new National Assembly. Now this is one of those events that helps to trigger the French Revolution because the king really opposes this idea of a national assembly and the rise of the uh, third estate. But the people of Paris like this idea. And when it looks like the king is gonna move against the national assembly, the Parisians rise up and they storm the Bastille. The Bastille is this fortress slash prison in Paris uh, known to have a lot of weapons in it. They attack this um, prison, they take the weapons and now the people of Paris are armed. They have weapons. They can defend the National Assembly against the king. Well, the king gets nervous. He's outnumbered. Paris has turned against him. So he flees Paris to the uh, royal estates out at Versailles and abandons his capital to basically be ruled by the National Assembly for a time. Now, this National Assembly, now free of uh, royalist pressure, um, is able to adopt a document known as the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Now, this document is going to outline the rights that all French citizens are entitled to. 
was very much inspired by the American Declaration of Independence. In fact, one of the chief authors is um, Lafayette, the Marquis de Lafayette, who was in America during the American Revolution. And Lafayette had assistance in writing this document by none other than Thomas Jefferson, the author of the American Declaration of Independence. So a lot of the ideas in this are ideas that came out of the De American Declaration of Independence. Um, this is the idea that all men are free and equal and all citizens are guaranteed basic rights. Now, Louis XVI refuses to recognize the rights of these French people. And uh, in October of 1789, this results in thousands of Parisian women, the Women's March on Versailles. They leave the city, they march the 20 miles out to Versailles, toting weapons, right? This is a women's army toting weapons to Versailles, and they threaten the king and um, demand that the king comply with the National Assembly and return to Paris. Louis agrees, because are you going to fire on a whole bunch of women? Uh, no, I don't think so, especially when they outnumber you. Um, and he comes back, and from that point on, he is a virtual prisoner in Paris. So with the king kind of set aside and no longer a factor, uh, the National Assembly can write a new constitution. And in 1791, that constitution is finished, which creates a constitutional monarchy. They still have a king. But the king would have very limited executive power, and all the laws of France would be written by a legislative assembly. Louis is not happy with this. He did not like his absolute power being stripped and giving a minor role within this government. And when he disagreed with his constitution, he attempted to flee, and many believe flee to create some sort of um, army to, you know, to retake Paris but he is captured during his flight. And at that point, he is seen as a threat to the people of Paris. And the assembly soon passed a law that said, if the king does prove himself to be a threat to the people of Paris and the people of France, that he could be tried as a criminal. That is going to have an effect on uh, the king in just a little while. But let's look at the group that's taking charge. The poor people of Paris didn't like the National Assembly. Okay, the National Assembly was this middle ground that they weren't happy with because the National Assembly, their new constitution, only allowed the wealthy to vote. Most of the people of Paris couldn't vote. They weren't represented in this government. So they rise up in riots and they storm the palace, the Tuileries Palace, and they kidnap the king. And they also storm the National Assembly. And with the National Assembly and the king kind of at the uh, beck and call of the Paris Commune, the assembly is forced to end the monarchy. No more constitutional monarchy, no more king. King Louis XVI isn't king anymore, he's just Louis. And the Paris Commune um, then used extreme measures to protect and safeguard this rebellion. It really turns into a radical rebellion. And as news of the events in Paris spread, neighboring monarchs, monarchs of other countries, start to get really nervous and they start to organize. They say, we can't allow this stuff to spread outside of France. We've got to get Louis XVI back on the throne. We need to make him king. We need stability in Europe. Now the Paris Commune hears about what's going on. They know about this. They're really nervous about a restoration. They like the fact that they're in power. So they start to use violence to seek out anybody in Paris who supports this idea. And any nobles who are suspected of conspiring with these foreign leaders are killed. And there's a dramatic amount of violence within uh, Paris at the time. But in the shadow of this violence, the First Republic, the First French Republic is formed. In late 1792, the newly elected National Convention uh, will meet. This is now going to be the government of Paris, of France, for a short time. Now, its factions disagree on a lot of things, but one of the things that they agreed on completely was that Louis XVI would be a rallying point for the enemies of the French Republic. So in early 1793, one of their early actions, they passed a law, a decree, that called for the execution of the former king. They wanted Louis XVI to die so that nobody could rally around him. And indeed, he will. On January 21st, early uh, 1793, 
Louis XVI is executed via the guillotine. That's this machine right here designed for removing somebody's head very quickly. Um, his execution triggers revolts amongst the loyal uh, French peasants. This was a very popular rebellion in Paris, outside of Paris, less popular. It also created a lot of anger within the monarchies surrounding France itself. Um, and we wind up with the an international coalition against this French Republic. All of these nations in red are about to declare war on the French Republic to try to restore the monarchy. This brand new French Republic, which is facing internal struggle, is now going to be overwhelmed without uh, external struggle as well. And we'll look a little bit more at what happens with that next time. But that is all for today. Thanks for joining me. I hope you learned a thing or two and farewell.